behaviorists. As a matter of fact, John Watson, the, the most famous of the uh, behaviorists, says that you have to treat human beings or look at human beings the way you would look at the ox you slaughter. See, the behavior is not interested in what's up in your head or your soul because they don't believe there is a soul. Watson's successor, Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner, believed all behavior could be manipulated to suit whatever ends the behavioral psychologist was seeking. Skinner developed what's called operant conditioning, where he uh, was able to demonstrate you can change animal behavior by certain schedules of reinforcement, by giving them rewards at certain times, and then you can teach pigeons to play ping pong, for example, and you can teach rats to run mazes, and you can teach human beings to seek certain economic or societal rewards. Skinner could actually shape new behavior patterns, and this actually was the sort of thing he quite soon became very famous for. Perhaps his most notorious experiment was the Skinner box. He was uh, designing the Skinner box, which was something like a big plate there, uh, but everything in its control, the temperature's controlled, the light's controlled, and, and so on. And the idea is then you uh, present children with certain stimuli that you want them to learn to react to. For nearly a year, Skinner isolated his daughter in a box similar to those he built for rats. The child was stimulated and had to respond in a certain way, like, like, an, like a chicken or a rat in a cage, because they firmly believe that children are animals. If you believe, though, that a, a child is a human being, you can't train him like a rat. Today, about $40 million a year in taxpayer money is paid out by the United States National Institute of Mental Health for behavioral psychology research a total of 19 billion since 1948. With these funds, psychiatrists apply the same conditioning techniques developed by Pavlov, Watson, and Skinner. Case in point, a juvenile detention center where children are hooked up to 270 volt batteries and shocked in a procedure called aversion therapy. Antoine was having a number of problems because he was up at a center that was shocking him every time he did anything. There was a button on a little, almost like a TV remote, that would be used and pushed. They will get an additional shock for trying to remove the electrode. So they are, they're expected to sit there and let this pa electricity pass through their skin without trying to remove it. If they yell in anticipation of the shock. They will shock the student an additional time for yell. The cost to, to send a student to Judge Rottenberg from New York is about 214000 per student. These students are tortured. They're given this electric shock therapy for no other reason but to inflict pain. Other techniques include administering electric shock to treat sexual deviance, sending powerful magnetic impulses through the skull to interrupt brain activity, and shooting high voltage through surgically implanted electrodes, all to stifle problem behavior, and costing up to $100,000 per patient. And while this science without a soul led to behavior modification techniques that continue to generate billions in research and treatment, it also laid the groundwork for another psychiatric movement that would cause the deaths of millions. January 1945, as World War II comes to a close, the full horror of Hitler's final solution is exposed. With grotesque killing factories, unparalleled in human history, mass graves filled with corpses of men, women and children, murdered by starvation, bullets and poison gas. What could drive men to commit such atrocities against their fellow human beings? The answer is the pseudoscience called eugenics, created and promoted by psychiatrists decades before the Nazis came to power. The eugenics movement got started in 1883 with Francis Galton, and he felt that human beings should take evolution in their own hands and that the most talented individuals, the most healthy individuals, the most attractive individuals should have more offspring. There was great concern that 
people that they considered had poor genes were reproducing faster than the people they considered had good genes. They felt that a medical solution might be the proper one. This is what led to the sterilization movement. It resulted in sterilization of mentally ill people, sterilization of retarded people, sterilization of people we don't like politically and sociologically. So the problem is not with genetics. The problem is a pretend phony genetics used to justify inhumane social policies. Though never proven as anything but theory, by the early part of the 20th century, eugenics had spread to almost 30 countries, from England to Brazil, Mexico, Sweden, Russia, and most notably, the United States, where forced sterilization was widely practiced. Eugenics movement in Germany was somewhat different than the eugenics movement in the United States in that uh, there were many more physicians and psychiatrists. Alfred Plutz was one of the pioneers in the German eugenics movement and how to control the population of those whom he considered inferior. In 1905, along with uh, his brother-in-law, Ernst Rudin, he established the first uh, organization for uh, racial hygiene. Alle Nationen haben sich mit einer außergewöhnlich großen Menge an minderwertigen, schwachen, kranken und verkrüppelten abzugeben. Durch kluge Gesetze über Sterilisation würden wir auch in der Lage sein, den vernünftigsten Weg der Zeugung herbeizuführen. Hitler was particularly impressed by American eugenicist Madison Grant. Grant's book, The Passing of the Great Race, was proclaimed by Hitler as his personal Bible. In his book, Mein Kampf, Hitler further hailed eugenics as the science that would rebuild the German nation. The German eugenicists welcomed the Nazi uh, advent to power because the Nazi program could fund the very programs that they had in mind. The Nazis gave them political support, financial support, and uh, conversely, the psychiatrists gave the Nazis a medical justification for uh, their uh, genocidal policies. Something like 40% of German psychiatrists had joined the SS by 1933. They weren't forced into the SS, they just joined it naturally, because the, because the beliefs were very, very similar. Rudin and his work led directly to the decision to move from sterilization to murder. Their plan was simple. First, convince the public that feeble-minded undesirables wanted to escape the burden of their existence, but could not say it, and that killing them was an act of mercy. Then extend the definition of inferior to include Jehovah's Witnesses, Jews, Gypsies, homosexuals, all unworthy of life. Psychiatrists produced propaganda movies known as the Nazi killing films, shown in all 5,300 theaters throughout Germany. Geisteskrankheit ist als ein Erdübel eine der größten Gefahren für die Volksgesundheit. Irrtum ist, dass sich solche Kranken glücklich fühlen und am Leben hängen. Sie haben überhaupt kein Daseinsbewusstsein. Wer von ihr befallen wird, dem ist die schwerste Last des Schicksals auferlegt. Ein Dasein ohne Leben. It first started with passive violence, which is starvation. It then intensified to lethal injections, and finally it developed into systematic gassing and cremation. Their headquarters were established in Berlin under the infamous code name T4. T4 program was named after Tiergarten 4, which essentially uh, resulted over a period of time in the murder of about 70,000 people who were deemed mentally retarded, emotionally distraught, or physically handicapped by the Germans. They were called life unworthy of living. The killing piloted in psychiatric institutions across Germany, then moved into the concentration camps, with top German psychiatrists as the executioners. Paul Nietzsche 
the T4 director declared. Das Aussortieren in den Konzentrationslagern lief einfach genauso ab wie in den Nervenheilanstalten. Und mit selbigen Erfassungsbögen. Six million Jews died in uh, concentration camps and as a result of Nazi extermination policies. Rudin uh, congratulated Hitler for making his, that is Rudin's, 30-year dream come true. After the Nazi surrender, an international court of justice was held to put psychiatry on trial for its war crimes. But American psychiatrists, fearing a permanent blow to the future of psychiatry, stepped in by shifting the blame onto a handful of German psychiatrists. There were some doctors who were uh, prosecuted, uh, but very few. Ernst Rudin uh, returned to Switzerland at the end of the war. He did not uh, serve any prison time. One of the strangest things of all about the legacy of Nazi science is that some of the nastiest uh, psychiatric eugenicists at the end of the war went back to work either in Germany or sometimes in the United States. What began with a psychiatric plan to eliminate undesirable humanity had now spread throughout the civilized world and was responsible for the murder of 11 million people. Never brought to justice, psychiatrists, as you will see, continued to advance eugenics around the world. And today we see the results in racism, human misery, and unending social conflict. After World War II, a new eugenics was resurrected out of the bones and ashes of the old eugenics. The eugenics movement has been at the forefront to establish a new scientific racism that justifies oppression and exploitation and racism. In fact, racism is inseparable from the roots of psychiatry. The entire history of psychiatry, beginning with scientific conclusions that were made in the 1830s, was an effort to prove the intellectual inferiority of African Americans. Benjamin Rush is the father of modern psychiatry, and he is the one that gave us the term nigritude. He said that all blacks have inherited this disease, and this particular disease, it caused them to be inferior. In addition to that, it was the reason why it was very important that blacks remain segregated and separate from whites so that whites did not inherit this disease. Asserting that negritude was a form of leprosy, Rush justified segregation as a medical necessity. And that became an argument to continue slavery. The fact that you have, uh, have brutalized a whole group of people had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with some genetic link and that basically you were just a diseased person. So when a slave master wanted to get rid of a, a recalcitrant slave, they could just say, oh, well, they're, they're suffering from this disease. Draptomania, that is the name of the mental disorder that was contrived by Samuel Cartwright, um, who said that blacks have a mental disorder if they had a desire to run away from slavery. Running away became such a uh, common problem that psychiatrists attempted to give that a disease. He says, well, that's a cure for that. And the answer was, the question was, well, what's the cure for that? Frequent whippings, frequent whippings. You'd be surprised how that disease clears up uh, when the lash is put in place of their excuses. After slavery was abolished, psychiatric racism not only persisted, it intensified. The American Journal of Psychiatry officially proclaimed that Negroes, as descendants of savages and cannibals, were ill-prepared for higher civilization, while their pseudoscience eugenics stepped up its racist activities. There is a clear and long and intimate connection between the eugenics movement and the Ku Klux Klan. Harry Laughlin, who was the Carnegie Institution's director of the eugenics record office, had close relationship to the Ku Klux Klan through the publication of a book called White America, which was written by a uh, major Klan leader. So Lachlan wrote a glowing review of the book in the Eugenics News. Uh, and at the same time, you have the Ku Klux Klan 
using eugenics to justify their racist